but we'll see. Uh, so we uh, so we don't have that feature that that uh, Franak was talking about for security. security. So is there anybody that looks suspicious in the room? You know, no. anybody suspicious in the room? Anybody oh, like no. with a name like Lukashenko or something? Is there anybody that looks suspicious in the room? Is it is it uh, is it a delay in the? Because I, I hear my voice like thirty seconds after. I think hmm. it's it's going to YouTube somewhere. Can you turn up? Uh, sorry, just to confirm, do you want me to go ahead and start admitting? There's about 40 people in the waiting room, so do you want me to start? Uh, just two, two, two seconds. Let's try not to respond okay. to what Anna asked, and then we'll do that. Franak, is in, uh, it's on YouTube? Yes, it is on YouTube already, just right now. Okay. Okay, so you could, you could let them in, and then we'll, uh, we'll just take it from there. Okay. And then we make some announcements at the beginning. Okay. Let's see what I see here. Oh, so Peter, Peter is in the Peter is here. Good. Hi Peter. Okay, so is everybody in? Yeah. Perfect. So, uh, dear audience, so, so we'll start. With, we'll start in five minutes. I think I will. I will delete our YouTube and I will create again because if in five minutes we don't want people to watch it, right? Uh, ah, no, 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 we could, we could take a second moment. So, so if, everybody, if everybody's in, good. So if everybody's in, then, then um, Anna, Anna could start. Yeah. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Anna Tadevosian, and I'm talking to you from Yerevan, Armenia. I want to thank you, uh, everybody, for being here today with us for the first virtual world learning event dedicated to sports. Uh, this program is part of the International Sports Programming Initiative at State Department Sports Diplomacy Exchange Program implemented by World Learning. Um, this webinar is produced by World Learning and Digital Communication Network. Um, it's a coalition of digital influencer for improving the information space supported by US Department of State Office of Citizen Exchanges. Um, Today is um, our topic is what can young athletes, coaches, and sports administrators do during this period of social isolation and distancing caused by COVID-19 crisis. Um, this webinar is a brainstorming session on how to continue to practice, love sports, and help young women and men um, behave responsibly during this um, health crisis. As you see, we have speakers from all over the world, and uh, we have two commentators. It's uh, Professor Nikos Panayoto from Thessaloniki, Greece, and Vlad Spencer from World Learning in United States. Um, and I want to start with the video uh, for a three minute video. I'll share now my screen. And. Um, we'll start. And, um, Please also turn off your um, microphone so everybody can listen. Okay, so I will start. Yes, you are peace.
<laughs> you also are young women in the year 2020. And I think it's, it's more likely now for you to play than it was for me when I was a little girl. And there's a lot of people out there who are willing to support you and to say, yes, you can. And uh, to to give you the, the kind of encouragement um, as a coaching as a coach. Some of you guys don't have, which is a lot of this. 15 forwards, baby. Um, thank you for watching. And as you see, uh, I put together a small video showing how people are trying to uh, overcome this crisis and stay at home and still practice and. Um, be healthy. So I will uh, pass now um, uh, the microphone to Vlad so we can start uh, with the speakers. And uh, okay. Thank you for being with us. Um, obviously, we'd all rather be, uh, you know, either practicing or you know, exercising or watching games these days, but unfortunately it's not possible. We have to uh, behave responsibly. And, um, and obviously this is the global crisis and we are more or less all in the same situation. Just a few words about, uh, you know, who's here with us uh, today. And, and some um, of the people that we, I'm gonna going to mention are actually in the audience. Um, I hope that, you know, in the audience, I don't see uh, the list here in front of me, we have Ryan Murphy uh, from the Sports Diplomacy at US State Department. And if he's with us, uh, then we'll ask him to say a few words at the end um, to, to let us know about uh, you know, what, they, what they do. Uh, but in general, what you have here is uh, people who have been either participants or partners uh, of all learning in sports diplomacy programs we've done over the last, um, say, seven or eight years. So that's the reason you see, uh, you know, we used to uh, have programs in Armenia and Turkey, um, you know, then we had um, all North Africa, um, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, we had a program in Colombia, and hopefully um, Lorian is going to be also with us. Uh, but the idea is that we wanted to bring everybody together. And, and uh, you know, when we started this, when I started the idea of, uh, of this webinar, uh, actually Ryan asked me if this is more or less kind of a, kind of a preparation session rather than actual uh, webinar. And the answer is that it is a little bit of both. So we wanted to, to bring together uh, all our friends and, and partners and participants, all of you being passionate about uh, the idea of using sports and educational tool. And, and, and talk to all of you, uh, you know, basically what is going on in your country region? You know, the second question might be, what is the impact? You all work with young people, some of them kids, some of them, you know, young athletes. And obviously, uh, you know, there's a psychological impact and there are all kinds of impacts that we need to talk a little bit and to address uh, collectively because you are all in the same situation. And also, you know, if you have any ideas, uh, you know, things that you did, things that you heard being done uh, by others, you know, how to mitigate, how to, on one hand, behave responsibly, and on the other hand, to be able to um, 
continue this this love, this passion for for sports, and continue to be active, you know, physically. Um, you know, it's good for the health, but it's also good for the mind. Just you know, a couple of words about um, you know what what Zoom allowed me to do. So, what you see, my background behind me is um, is one of the things that we, we miss the most: the real exchange. Um, you know, so what you see, participants in the exchange and guests. Uh, so, I have this as a background, as a reminder that one day. Uh, this is going to be over. We are all going to be victorious if you behave responsibly. And at the same time, we'll go back to what we all love to do. That is, you know, being around sports people, doing sports, and, and, uh, and, and loving, loving, loving sport. So that being said, um, uh, Anna, uh, you know, please, um, you know, give the microphone the floor, the imaginary floor, the virtual floor. Um, in, in any order that you, you think is good. So please, um, you know, three or four minutes each one of you, and, and hopefully in the audience, uh, we're going to get some questions, some, some um, you know, um, ideas. Uh, you know, for the audience, there is a chat option uh, in Zoom where you could actually write the questions. And this makes it easier because, uh, you know, the moderators who look at the questions, actually select them and ask the, the, the speakers. Or there is an option for you to raise your imaginary hand and, and, uh, and signal that you'd like to speak uh, via the microphone. Uh, let's make this dynamic, short, and, and hopefully it's going to be a useful conversation, useful for everybody who wants to, um, you know, mitigate and, and to, um, you know, fulfill this passion for sports throughout this difficult period. So thanks for being here. Thank you, Vlad. I also want to mention that we have my colleagues here, Laurel and Aaron, will help us with, uh, if we have um, uh, chats, uh, questions, so they will monitor, they will um, help me. So I would like to start with Dr. Arizu because uh, this is hard time for everybody and mostly in interest. And so I want um, her to explain how to deal with this crisis now. Dr. Arizu. Thank you for the introduction. Hello, everybody. Um, I hope everyone is healthy and safe through this um, global pandemic. Um, so just a little bit of my background. I am a licensed clinical psychologist. I've done uh, sports psychology on the side. I do a lot of trauma work in my own practice. Um, and so the goal of today for me is to talk a little bit about seven main factors of looking at mental health with athletes. Um, and um, there's no primary order of this, of what is you know, the most important, what not I think all, all areas are. Um, I think when working with athletes, whether you're parents, coaches, uh, referees, it doesn't matter what your role is or where your dynamic is with the athlete, um, there's certain things that is important to keep in mind um, with mental health. Um, one is routine, uh, especially now more than ever, routine is really important you know, keeping that structure of your exercise, of your time, how much time you're putting in, not losing track of that. And that's really easy to lose track of. Um, you know, when you are used to waking up early in the morning and going out for a run at five in the morning or, you know, hitting the gym <laughs> at 5 p.m. or 6 p.m. and doing your workout at the gym. So it's really crucial to keep that schedule maintaining that schedule. So routine is the first thing that I want to highlight. Um, second one, uh, social support system. That's very important. Connecting like this, something like this. This is, this is amazing. This is, you know, using virtual connection as a way of having athletes connecting with each other. And that community, that sense of community is very important right now. Um, and not being in that feeling of isolation because the more the athletes are able to connect with each other, communicate with each other, the more they're gonna feel that sense of belonging and not that isolation feeling. So that's uh, factor number two. Um, factor number three, physical activity should still be a must. So, you know, getting, you have to become creative. Like in the video that Anna showed, you have to really get creative and how you're going to stay physical, how you're going to, you know, continuously 
do your workouts within the home, in the backyard, in the front yard, um, you know, getting creative using your steps or, you know, jump ropes, whatever you can find to, you know, utilize your space and um, creating your own gym and doing workouts in the gym. I had um, one individual that in their backyard on their fence, they drew a, um, a, a, a football uh, goal and they were just kicking the ball against the, the fence, which, you know, that's creative. You know, that's what you have to do. You have to get really creative in how you get your works, uh, works out in the day. Um, number four, and I know I'm going through this super quick because we're, you know, we want to make sure everybody has time to talk. Um, but please welcome to, you know, send me questions later. Uh, number four is, depends on the age developmentally with the athlete, but it's important. It's the role of the parents. I think parents need to be in a good place as well. And they are role models to the kids, to the athletes. And how, as parents, we are showing these kids how, how we are handling the stress because they watch us. Um, we're their model. So they watch us. They are sponges. They absorb. They look at us. And if we're stressed and we're anxious and we're panicking, then they're going to think that's how they need to respond and react to this pandemic. And so as parents, as coaches, we have to be super mindful of how we're presenting our own stuff in front of them and, you know, making sure we're in a good place. And when we're working with our athletes, we're showing that resiliency that if this is going to be okay, we will get through this. I think that's really critical, especially with the younger athletes. Um, number five, okay. Limiting news exposure. So I, <laughs> I really, I want to really highlight and emphasize that, you know, sitting, having the TV on from morning till night and the athletes are practicing in another room or, you know, that it's, they hear it and they're constantly, it's, it's in their mind constantly and, it, and it's not healthy. It doesn't help. You know, um, what I tell my patients is, listen, I get it. You want to know what's going on. You want to be informed. And that's great. And I think that's important, but maybe just limiting it to 30 minutes a day, you can really recap and get the information you need in 30 minutes. The TV does not need to be on from nine in the morning till 10 o'clock at night on a news channel um, because it is a lot and it can really impact you negatively and emotionally. And so we have to be mindful of how much we're absorbing from that. Um, Number six, being present, being in the moment. Um, it is so easy for us to immediately go into this mindset of all the negative things that could happen, all the bad things that could happen. What if, what if I fail? What if I don't play well? What if the season starts and I, you know, I'm not in a good shape? So we have to be really mindful of being in the moment. What can I do today? What are some things I can focus on today? What goes into my last and most important factor is focusing on what we have control over. There's a lot that we don't have control. Um, but really focusing on things that we can control in our own environment. You know, I always tell patients, we can't control external factors. We can't, we cannot control the environment. What we can control is our own behavior, our own actions, our own reaction to the situation. So the pandemic is something we don't have control over. But what I have control over is how I'm going to react to it. I can either get really anxious, really sad, really depressed. I can allow it to be a barrier for me or I can look at it as an opportunity of doing things differently and improving in other areas that I didn't even think would be an opportunity. So those are the seven factors that, you know, I wanted to highlight today. Again, um, 
I know I, this could be like a full day lecture, <laughs> but, um, you know, if feel free, if you have questions, you're welcome to, um, and maybe, um, a lot, we could, you know, send out my e email address to everyone. If anyone wants to reach out to me directly, I'd be happy to, uh, correspond that way as well. Definitely. And, and we'll do that. Um, I have a quick, quick question. Um, yes. you hear me, yeah? Uh, so I can hear you, yes. a, a young person comes to you and says, look, that means, you know, sure, pandemic, you know, everybody could take it. However, less likely to impact young, uh, young people. Why do I have to be disciplined? You know, it's not going to impact me um, as much as maybe uh, an elderly population. What would be the response to that? So let me, I just want to clarify your question. So you're saying if someone comes to me a young and person. there's a young person and they're saying, well, this isn't really going to impact me. Correct. Okay. Um, why, I mean, why do I have to stop practicing? Why do I have to, you know, follow the social distancing? Right. And I think, you know, my response to that is, is that, well, you're not, you're not going to stop practicing. You know, you, you can practice, you just have to get creative in how you're going to practice. You might not be able to have, you know, the, the typical practice with your teammates or with the team out in the field, but you're still, again, it goes to that routine, keeping that routine, keeping that structure um, and continuing that process. But with, you know, the distance, the social distancing, it's more of, okay, well, you got looking at it in another perspective of you still have virtual connections you know, you're still connecting, you're connecting with other people, you're communicating with other people. It's all about perspective, you know, and if we just shift the way we look at this, if we look at it as it's very black and white, I either practice with, you know, out in the field with my team or I don't. Well, when we think that way, we're not giving ourselves that flexibility to be open-minded about other ways and other um, opportunities to address this. So I think I would just challenge them on that to just see things in a little bit different way. Can I ask okay. another question if we have time? Yeah, just, yeah. just quick and then we'll go quickly around there. All right, thank you. Uh, Vlad, in response to your question and your answer, uh, when we get back, when this whole crisis is over, um, I'm looking at if we train our athletes, we need to tell them what to do. Uh, don't, you don't need to do that. Uh, what precisely to work on because we can't work on anything. And what I'm looking at, what I'm focusing on is the, uh, the mental part about being really frustrated because we had a set of abilities that we cannot save or we cannot uh, work on right now. And when we get back out there, uh, some kid or some girl gonna tell me, I used to do it very well. Now I can do it. So what I to them? Yeah. Definitely. And, and again, when you ask questions, please introduce yourselves because, you know, it doesn't, uh, we're not, we not uh, CNN yet, yet to actually yeah. have the subtitle. Um, for sure. My name is uh, Yannick Brunel. I'm from uh, Jerusalem, Israel. I'm head of the, uh, I'm, I'm head of a basketball club in Israel and part of the competitive sports unit for the Hebrew University. Thank you. I'm Thank here you. on behalf okay, so, of Hoops for Peace basketball organization. So that's Perfect. So, Anna, let's uh, continue. So, if you have an answer, we'll I would get... like to hear it. Sure. Uh, if anybody has an answer, uh, maybe, maybe quickly. What do you come to say for the athletes when we go back? Yeah. Uh, we, uh, I can, I can, we can answer that later. It's gonna take a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. So let's let's do that first, and then we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll gather back. the questions. We'll yeah. come back to that question. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ariso. Very nice advices, I think. And uh, if you will have questions to Dr. Arizo, please um, post it in chat and my colleagues will um, ask the questions um, as you post. Uh, um, our next speaker is Susan Potts. Uh, she is a director of Athletes for Hope from USA. Susan, please. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for having us. Uh, and Dr. Arizu, we definitely want to get your contact information. I was taking such copious notes when you were talking. because I feel like this really relates to everybody. I'm in Austin, Texas, and um, Athletes for Hope is actually based out of Washington, D.C., but there are several of us that are remote. So we are so thrilled to be here today. 
We work with professional Olympic and student athletes across um, the US and, and parts of the globe to educate them about sports philanthropy, to connect them to causes that they're passionate about and to recognize those efforts on social and traditional media. So we're a nonprofit and um, we've been just trying to connect athletes to causes for the past 13 years. Uh, we were started by Muhammad Ali, Mia Hamm, Andre Agassi, an incredible base of athletes, which has now propelled us into over 7,000 athletes across uh, 25 different sports and leagues. I think um, I just want to touch on what, what we do. And uh, I know later we're going to talk about how that has changed for us. But we basically, uh, to Dr. Arzu's point, in a period of great change and growth, uh, I think a lot of innovation and learning are happening with our organization right now. And the biggest thing that I, I took away from your talking points were being flexible and not getting stuck in, well, this is how we've always done things. We're really having to kind of pivot into a new way of thinking when we work with athletes. So we're hearing from our student athletes who are frustrated, depressed, anxious, sad. And so um, looking at ways that we can address mental health advocacy and things like that, um, especially the health disparities. So um, Anna, I don't know if you want me to touch on what we're doing or, or, or you want me to stop with our introductions. Uh, no, what, what are you doing in these times of crisis? Or what, what you advise to your athletes? Or are they doing like practicing at home or you prepare some special program for them? Great question. Yeah, so typically we were doing workshops in front of groups of athletes. We were going out and meeting with, you know, the Redskins or um, LSU student athletes. And so that has obviously stopped. So what we've done is created opportunities for our athletes to volunteer uh, online or from home. So we've been sending out opportunities to connect in their communities. We have worked uh, to create AFH Fit at Home, which is a series of videos that we have on our YouTube channel. Um, you can just look up Athletes for Hope on YouTube and you'll find a series of videos every week that we're dropping. And we've had overwhelming number of athletes that want to submit just one or two things that they're doing at home and then we're putting them together every day now. We've had so many videos come in, we're able to put out content every day. Um, so student athletes, professional athletes, uh, Fridays, we have a fun day where they're doing games. We're also doing a classroom champions partnership where once or twice a week, we're going to have a pro athlete go live on Facebook and talk to partners, um, as well as putting out words of hope. So our founders are all putting together words of hope for people just to inspire and connect. And we're asking our athlete base to do the same for their, you know, friends, family, coaches, community. So we're excited to do more work in the virtual space and hopefully step into more virtual workshops, hospital visits, and so on. And for everybody who's watching and, and including the speakers, you know, we are going, we have all your emails as you registered. So we'll, you know, give you links to uh, every, everything that is said, uh, is said here because uh, organizations like Athletes for Hope, you know, Basketball Embassy, other organizations represented here, are amazing in this field then you should be connected and actually one of the goals of this webinar the, the virtual series is to connect you with people that you could continue to work with during these difficult times but even beyond so so don't worry we'll give you links and we'll give you connections and emails and all the other stuff awesome thank you sure. okay. thank you susan Thank you very much. And uh, we'll come to the questions later after all the speakers. Um, so now um, I want to introduce you to Abdullah Ibrahim al makavi from Bahrain. He's an um, analyst for Bahrain U19 football national team. And he's one of our participants in our sports programs. Uh, Abdullah, um, can you hear us? Can yeah, hear us? hi, Anna. Okay, hi. Hi, hi good evening, hi. everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, say that I'm extremely honored to be with some distinguished speakers and uh, guests over here. And I want to remind everyone that we are on this together. So uh, this moment is for us together and we will pull through one day. Uh, as for what we do, uh, as Anna said, I work uh, professionally with the uh, under-19 national team. I'm the team analyst. And as far as our training program is concerned, that training program is actually going on on a daily basis. We work on a remotely uh, capacity with the players. So they have mainly a fitness program 
that they have to uh, attend to every day. And there is a lot of feedback and observation from the coaches from distance. So it's mainly to do with their fitness levels because there is only so much you can do from a professional capacity level. Uh, but I wanted to touch upon something that is extremely important. I mean, one of football legends is Johan Cruyff, and he says that in every uh, disadvantage, there is an advantage. And I, I, I agree with that strongly because I think in this time, it's a massive opportunity for every athlete, coach, and everyone involved in sports uh, to remind themselves about two main things. Number one, there hasn't been any time before for us as athletes or coaches uh, to really slow down in a word so fast to take time, reflect, and look back at everything we've been doing and everything that we want to do after this finish. So um, it's a good time for us to look back at what we were doing before. And if it really matches our principles and ambitions and dreams and reflect on what ways can we improve and in what ways can we make ourselves better athletes or coaches. So uh, not even post-season, not even a pre-season, as flexible enough for us to really have no deadline, no understanding of when will this be over. Uh, so this time there is a unique opportunity for us to work without pressure and to kind of reflect on our inner self more and invest on our mental health and our um, dreams and hopes after this is over. Uh, another thing which is far more important in my opinion, which is uh, it's a good time for athletes to understand that, especially the young ones, that they are more than just an athlete because they are a person, they are a whole, and they have an identity. And this identity should not be blended with the identity of an athlete so much that when they face something like that, they struggle to live with it. Because believe it or not, this is a blessing. Every athlete is exposed to have an early retirement um, career injury, or for example, uh, they get something in their life that forces them to leave sports so early and they cannot live with adversity. They cannot live with this ambiguity of what's going to happen now. Football is all I know or basketball is all I know. So at this moment is really important in my opinion for them to sit down, to realize that even though we are great athletes, we are much more and sports should drive our uh, personal aspirations and our personal hopes, but it should not be the ultimate end. Because one day, even if you don't face any injury, you'll get 37, 39, and then you'll have to stop. And here begins a different word for you. And if you're not ready, then I don't know what's going to happen to you. So this time, everyone is kind of having the same uh, way of thinking that we, we can only do so much. But believe me, as the doctor said, uh, you can get really creative as a coach and as a player. And you can work even on your tactical understanding of the game, which requires team members to be present. But if you're creative enough, you can work on your cognitive capacity, cognitive capacity within the game or your technical capacity within the game. So I don't think it's, a, it's, a, it's something that we should uh, get frustrated with as much as a something or it's an opportunity for us to really look at the sports or, or the game from a different perspective. Um, Abdullah, you know, to, to, I think it would be interesting as we go around the world a little bit, maybe yeah. to tell us a little bit of what is the situation in relation to coronavirus in Bahrain. You mean uh, and we could do this with every single speak. Yeah, that means, you know, so, you know, mm. cases in terms of, in terms of, you know, how, how serious seems to be and uh, what, you know, what the country doing in order to mitigate and in order to behave responsibly. I mean, as for our situation as a country, I think the government is doing an extremely uh, good job. Everyone, I think, would share the same uh, feeling because the way they have responded to that or even the way they took measures before it even happened allowed us to have one of the best recovery rates in the world. And uh, this is the thing that makes everyone here a little bit more relaxed than they should be because they think or they feel that they're protected with good leadership. And uh, as I told you, we don't have any curfews. We don't have any uh, uh, laws forced upon us to stay at home, but the public or the people are doing this by themselves 
because they know better. They know that this is the way they can protect the other. And uh, this is the way we can pull out together as a nation. So I think uh, it's relatively stable. Uh, stable is not the word right now, but it's, uh, it's relatively stable. Um, it's, 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 uh, it, I don't know if it's, it can be better, but I think this is the best we can do as a nation and as a government. And I'm very hopeful that uh, if we continue at the same rate and with the same measures and understanding and wisdom, I think we can pull through. So that's what's happening in Bahrain. Thank, thank you. Thank you. And uh, one more question I have here, Abdullah. As you work with the young athletes, um, how they uh, take it? Do you have coaches talking to them constantly or do we have doctors talking to them? I mean, it's hard for them to be in the locked in the houses and not go out and practice and what's coming for their futures, for the clubs and all etc. How you do this? How you deal with that? I think it's uh, it's something that uh, we worked on without even realizing. This is the importance of building bridges before everything happens. So personally, I have a great relationship individually with each and every single player that I work with. And they know that they can always reach out to me. So in these difficult times, uh, they are actually making sure that they're staying connected to me. And I personally work with uh, different athletes as well, different individuals on a personal mm -hmm. capacity. So they came in for consultation, they came in for individual programs, and I have created these uh, small uh, programs with uh, cycles extending to one week to two weeks for them to stay active and to work on something that they've missing. So for example, uh, a player came to me and asked me, I have this uh, flow in my game and I don't know how to work on that uh, uh, point exactly. So I sat down with him and I had a Zoom interview and then we drew a whole program for this athlete to work on this program by himself or by herself. So uh, for most of our players, especially our play players, because we're working with around 30 players because it's professional national mm -hmm. level. So we get the, the, the top of the top athletes in Bahrain. And uh, because we build good bridges with them, uh, now we find it very easy to navigate how they should uh, work on themselves uh, remotely from us. So that is what we are doing right now. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much, Abdullah. And we'll move to our next speaker, Peter Lewis. Um, he's a fund founder and executive director of Arkiswa School. He's based in Tanzania. And now let's see how they are dealing with the crisis and uh, what's the situation in Tanzania. Peter? And, and before, before yeah. Peter starts, I just want to mention that uh, Peter's students came for an exchange that we did in cooperation right. with uh, Athletes for Hope. Uh, amazing, uh, you know, girls, uh, good at basketball, good at everything, extremely impressive. Unfortunately, you know, the, the outbound exchange, the exchange in Tanzania is, is, is postponed now, but we are looking forward uh, to, uh, to be there and, and, and meet with you and, and, and the athletes because they're, they're really impressive and they deserve the best. Yeah, well, great. Well, thank you all so much for having me. And um, this is, uh, I see this as a great networking opportunity as I'm, uh, I'm here in Princeton, New Jersey, sort of uh, trapped in my, uh, uh, my home here, uh, away from Tanzania, actually now. Um, so yes, I'm the, uh, my name is Peter Lewis, and I'm the, I'm the founder director of a school called Orcasewa School. Um, I'm also the director of a basketball development program called Grow the Game, which focuses on uh, girls' youth development uh, from girls coming up from the second and third grade all the way up to uh, the U16 and the U18 girls' national team, which I uh, have been coaching in Tanzania for the past, um, I guess it's about four years now. Um, and so that those those opportunities have been um, have been really incredible and given us opportunities to partner with some of you who are here who are here on the call. Um, I think in Tanzania, one of the one of the things that's making our situation a little bit unique when just hearing others talk about the work that they're doing is is technology and our lack of it. So we don't have, uh, our kids don't have phones, our kids don't have computers, our kids don't have televisions. And, and even when we think about their parents, if their parents have 
uh, a telephone. It's it's not a big fancy smartphone. It's <clears throat> probably a little talk and text uh, Nokia or something like that. So so I, I'm really interested to hear and listen from you all um, today, as as we don't have a lot of programming going on for our our, our children right now in Tanzania. What one of the things we're trying to do is actually speak to the families uh, through their through their parents' cell phones. And, and really what our focus is, is not actually basketball development right now. It's actually their personal safety. So in Tanzania, you've got uh, over 25% of teenage girls are pregnant uh, and about 27% uh, of girls get get pregnant in their teenage years in Tanzania. So that is a constant battle. And now you can imagine with all the girls home, uh, you can imagine uh, there's a lot of all the university graduates are back in the villages. Uh, a lot of the young men who work as security guards in other communities. Um, we're based in uh, near Arusha, Tanzania. So Nairobi and Mombasa and other places where these young men work. Uh, a lot of these businesses are closed down, so they've come home. Um, so, so we're basically sort of like focusing on baseline protection of how do we keep our kids safe uh, through this through this challenging time. Um, yeah, I, uh, I I'm interested to learn and hear, and, and maybe some people have some some ideas from it. How do you work with kids when you don't have that technolo- uh, technological link to them, and you can't you can't do video with them and you can't send them uh, workout plans and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, so yeah, thank you all for, for the work that you're doing. The, the situation in Tanzania, Vlad wanted us to talk a little bit about, so what, what we're seeing is about a little over 50 cases now um, confirmed, which we all know means there are thousands of cases probably. Uh, you know, the testing, if you think there's a problem of testing here in the U.S. or other places, you can imagine what testing like is in Tanzania, one of the worst healthcare situations in the world. Um, uh, you want to talk about ventilators, you know, we don't have them. There's a handful of them in the whole country. Um, so, so yeah, we're really concerned about that. And we're very worried about what what will be the outcome there as, as the cases continue to grow. So like I said, around 50 can confirmed cases um, and, uh, you know, growing every day, but, but growing quite slowly. And I think that has to do with the testing we've done. We're, we're trying to do on the COVID prevention. We're trying to do outreach via our alumni. So our school has been uh, in existence for uh, 12 years. And so we've got a number of alumni who are now back living uh, they're, they're in university or they've graduated and work at our school. So we're sending them a lot of information and actually printing infographics and other things from the government and the alumni are out in the villages taking them around and speaking to to the families um, uh, in these rural Maasai villages where we work and trying to have those conversations about what prevention looks like uh, and, and things like that. So so we're in a bit of a u- unique situation here and uh, just doing doing everything we can to uh, um you know, on the mitigation side and, and to keep our girls and, and boys safe as well. Um, there's some there's some wonderful people on this call that I really want to connect with after the call. And I'm really excited to to hear some of your work. And uh, I really look forward to reaching out to you uh, after this call and, and sharing more. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. I'm sure that um, uh, after all speakers, uh, we will brainstorm and see what we can do in, in different cases and mostly for the girls in Tanzania, everybody kids in Tanzania, because I think it's very important. We have some, um, you know, from UEFA, we have some programs that you um, uh, we can send to you and you can share with the girls. I just You can just call the parents and tell them what they need to do and how they need to practice. So I think that um, after all, uh, we will have lots of ideas how to do it. And thank you for for your uh, input. Thank you. So we will uh, move on. And uh, our next speaker will be Firat Ozdalian. Uh, he's from Turkey. He's a um, basketball coach. And now he's a lecturer in the Faculty of Sports Science in Dokus Eyüp University in Izmir. Uh, he's uh, one of our first um, sports exchange program participants. He participated in uh, 
conflict resolution through sports basketball program between Turkey and uh, Armenia. And uh, we met there first time. And uh, let's see how the situation is in Turkey and uh, how Firat and his students are dealing with it. Firat. Uh, hello to everyone. Um, first of all, uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, great webinar for sharing my uh, thoughts, everyone, and give me the opportunity to, to listen and learn a lot of things from uh, my colleagues, my coach, friends, and all around from all around the world. So, uh, first of all, I want to start with uh, what am I doing here? How are we handling the situation? Uh, and for example, in in Turkey, uh, you know, we don't have curfews, but uh, the government asks everyone to stay at home as much as possible. So during this time, uh, the schools are closed, uh, you know, the university courses are closed, so everybody stays at home. And so we have to keep on teaching online. Education keeps still going online. So I'm really busy with, uh, in my daily time, I'm really busy with, uh, with those online courses even i'm staying home i'm really busy uh, i want to tell you about my uh, students what they are thinking how they're handling this because i am always every day spending time with them asking how they are feeling uh, asking their situation and whatever so um, most of them are frustrated about this but there are some uh, students uh, they are really happy about the staying at home because their life slowed down and they were really busy to go to school, lessons and then uh, practices, uh, games. Some of them are coaching. They have uh, youth players, basketball players. So uh, some of them are happy, but most of them are frustrated and they really don't know when this is going to uh, finish. Uh, they have really big question marks in their minds. So I'm always um, trying to uh, keep in touch with them and tell them to, uh, you know, stay at home, uh, keep, the, keep themselves busy with uh, doing something uh, is important for them. For example, uh, some of my colleagues just uh, mentioned that uh, during their running time, I mean, when they're outside going to school, practice and everything, when everything goes, really fast they don't have time to spend for themselves or the, for their families so first of all uh, i'm really uh, suggesting them that uh, they can do whatever they plan but doesn't have time to do during their daily lives so and the most thing i'm trying to tell them is to develop themselves for example some of them um, needs to develop themselves about um, exercise physiology some of them wants to develop themselves about uh, coaching education, uh, coaching training, uh, exercise sciences, and etc. Uh, so this is a great uh, opportunity to, to spend uh, their time with uh, learning and gaining and putting themselves more stairs up when this uh, situation is over. So. Uh, during this time, uh, Dr. Arizo really mentioned a really important thing. We need to be a role model. I'm uh, trying my best to do this uh, for my students. And uh, I'm trying to advise them if they need anything. For example, I am, by the way, I am the, uh, really in charge of the basketball coaching department and basketball coaching special lessons. So uh, most of the mm, students uh, we, uh, we are working with are coaching with youth players. So they're asking me what can they do during this time they can practice. Uh, and we are trying to plan trainings. How can we do this online or virtually? Uh, and we are trying our best to uh, support those youth kids and uh, my students because, okay, they are grown up, they are adults, but still they are really young. Uh, 20, they, they are about around 20 years old. So they really need this support and I'm trying my best to give this to them. So uh, actually I, I see some of my, uh, some of my friends, uh, uh, they are doing really, for, for me, they are new ways uh, and they are really exciting th things for the youth uh, kids uh, to exercise at home. 
uh, and I want to share them, but probably next time mm, we will do next round. I'm going to do that uh, because I don't want to take time that much. So, um, and if you ask me to tell you about some uh, about the situation in Turkey, uh, yeah, in Turkey, you know, we are uh, having. I think we are the fifth in the Europe that, that uh, in the number of total cases. So. Um, we are in a we are not in a bad situation, uh, but we have almost close to uh, five hundred thousand uh, total cases. But most of them are young people, so there's uh, we are not waiting a big problem about them about their uh, health situation, and uh, so there is no uh, curfew in, in Turkey. But uh, younger people, because you know, twenty years old and younger uh, than twenty years. People, you know, they may may uh, may show no uh, symptoms, but they can still spread uh, this virus to other people. They can still infect other people, so even they don't have any symptoms. So, um, 20 years and younger have curfew in Turkey. They gotta stay at home unless they have not an emergency situation. Uh, and the, uh, above 65 years old people and older than them, because. Uh, they have curfew because they are really, um, if they get infected, they can have really uh, big problems about their health situation. So uh, except all those people, I mean, between 20 and 65 years old people, there is no curfew, but still uh, we all need to stay at home as much as possible. Uh, and uh, thank you for letting me share my opinions and I'm waiting for my other round to give you some more examples or if we have time, I can give you some examples right now too. I'll we'll, give, uh, uh, we'll get to that after and um, we'll have more uh, webinars like this. So we'll have the opportunity yeah. to share our experiences. All right. Now I want to move to to the, thank you Firat for, for your input and uh, You're welcome. to, to uh, next speaker, uh, Ruben Lescano. He's in Spain, but he's a head of the methodology at Football Federation of Armenia. And uh, Ruben, uh, I want you to tell about um, a little bit about the situation in Spain uh, and how um, the Spanish um, football players, how they are dealing with it and how you are helping Armenian football players to deal with this situation. Hello, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this webinar. Well, um, here the situation in Spain is, uh, is very difficult. We have 180,000 people infected and almost uh, 20,000 <coughs> 20, people dead. So uh, we are five now five weeks uh, in quarantine at home. And uh, athletes, football players, they are doing as much as they can in this situation because we can't leave our houses. We have to stay at home. So uh, from the physical point of view, most of them are working by, by themselves. They are following the, the guidelines of their clubs. Um, but, uh, well, uh, I think uh, maybe we are... We are focusing too much in the in the fitness point of view in sports. I think, from my point of view, uh, this situation this uh, situation is going to be is 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 especially difficult because of the economical and structural point of view, because this is going to to make a, a change. This is going to we we are going to we will have to, to change our point of view in the way we are working in sports. There are many people who are going to lose their job. There are many people who are going to lose the money they, they were getting from the government to continue with their studies, with their uh, sport. And for me, this is the, the big problem. The, of course, it's a problem to, to, to be at home. It's a problem to live over sport. But as Abdullah said before, I think this is also we have to, to, to try to, to see the, the positive point of view. This is a break. We can slow down. 
we have time to reflect and we have time to focus in uh, other sides, other points of our sports. We usually focus in technique, we usually focus in fitness, but we can also use this time to focus in the way we organize our sport, in the way we work, in coaching. And in this line, I'm trying to help my coaches, my all coaches, not only my coaches in Armenia, but all coaches. I had an idea to try to help them through a website um, to try to help them to improve their coaching, offering them the possibility to read articles from other languages. Uh, since I've been in Armenia, I, I have realized there is a big problem to get information from other, country, from other countries due to language. It's a problem for them, but it's a problem for me because I can't read Armenian. So I, I thought that it would be good to have a, a website where we can uh, upload articles in Spanish and, tra and translate them into a different language, into Russian, into Armenian, into English. And this way, people from Armenia can read articles about football written in Spanish, and I can read articles about football written in Armenia. It's a, like a cultural exchange. So I'm working on this to try to help other people to, to improve their coaching learning about other cultural, other cultures, sports. This is the, the way I'm, I'm doing. Thank you, Ruben. And I know that uh, Ruben wants to, um, all of you here, to help with other languages as well. And we can uh, help him to develop this website uh, by translating and giving um, um, the articles uh, about football, about tactic techniques anywhere. Um, and uh, I think here in this group, we can uh, make this platform bigger and uh, get um, lots of languages in this website. I have a brief question, um, if you don't mind, uh, for, for Ruben. So, and uh, Ruben, you are going to figure out what's my favorite Spanish team uh, based on my <laughs> question. Uh, so, uh, you know, here in the United States, Starting with President Trump, actually, um, and, and in general, that is, you know, people obviously are, are missing a lot from their previous life, but uh, Americans are, are sports lovers. And, and this idea on when sports will come back is a question that, you know, starting with the president and getting into, uh, you know, the general population is an important question. So the question that is going to reveal my passion, when is Messi going to come back and play in front of audiences? Any thoughts about when the sports activity uh, might be resumed in Spain, considering how hard the country was, was hit? I think in front of the audience uh, in September, not before September. Because okay. probably the La Liga, it will continue, but with the stadiums closed. Good, thank you. I'm not going to ask you what's your favorite thing, because obviously <laughs> a coach you cannot tell. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sure. thank you Ruben. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker will be Chris Dial. He's a president and founder of the Basketball Embassy from US. Uh, Chris? Yeah, I'm here. Chris, Thanks, you're here. Okay. Hi. Okay. So, floor is yours, please. Thanks. Um, yeah. Hello to everybody from uh, San Antonio um, in the smaller country of Texas, inside the larger country of the United States. Uh, we've we've got about uh, shy of I think fifteen thousand confirmed cases in just Texas. Um, the city of San Antonio has uh, around seven hundred, um, and fortunately for us in the city, we've only had about 30, 33 deaths I think so far recorded. Uh, and we are you know we're trying to survive like everybody else. I, I enjoy these kind of formats because. Um, they always provide a great amount of perspective uh, for, for me and for, you know, a lot of the people that I've invited to join in and, and uh, participate in this. So uh, listening to some of you in some of these places of the world, many of which I've been to, um, you know, thoughts go out to you guys. Uh, and uh, we're, you know, like it's been commented on, we're, we're kind of all in this together. Um, the basketball embassy, uh, is a it's a nonprofit organization based out of the U.S., but does uh, a bulk of our work internationally, especially in Europe and parts of the Middle East. 
got some friends from Turkey on this uh, thread. And, and uh, Firat, I'm looking forward to uh, connecting with you after this as well. Dr. Taram is here. Um, and then I've got some folks here from our organization. Um, as you guys are participating in that chat, if you're not in the chat, there's some really good exchanges going on. So, uh, you know, please make sure you guys hop on there. But uh, Zach Mason is is working with our organization, Eric Batoni and uh, Mary Olin Jaffet. These are all sports minded, like minded people that are on this uh, on this thread. So um, I, you know, basically just as Vlad mentioned um, and Vlad, thanks again, Anna, you guys for uh, putting this on um, and our friend Ryan Murphy, hopefully Ryan's not asleep yet, but he's, he's on there somewhere. Uh, but we appreciate the opportunity to share and exchange and, uh, you know, doing the best that we can. Obviously, during <laughs> We do a lot of youth programs and projects right here in San Antonio and in Central Texas. Um, we work with at-risk youth. Uh, we work with uh, homeless youth. Uh, we try to reach populations that are a little bit underserved. And we use the game of basketball, uh, like many of you use sport, to accomplish a lot of different things. Um, there's a lot of intangible elements to our curriculum, teaching kids technical skills like many of you are. We're also teaching them life skills like many of you are. Uh, this has been an incredibly difficult time for me personally because I'm not able to get in front of kids uh, right now. And um, I, you know, uh, Dr. Rizu mentioned the, you know, the importance of staying present. Sometimes I don't do that. I start feeling sorry for myself uh, because I can't get in front of uh, our youth our coaches and interact and exchange. So what we've had to do is we, like many of you, we've tried to take a more virtual uh, platform and we're fortunate, uh, you know, as, as Peter talked about some of the uh, challenges that they've got, we're fortunate that we've got some incredible partners and uh, we've got a platform to where we can do that. So we've, we've created videos, um, online sessions, and we're using our network to pulse those out to those kids wherever we can. Uh, so these boys and girls are getting online um, and they're seeing, you know, their coaches and they're seeing their their peers and they're participating, um, you know, the best way that they can. We run into resource issues even in, in the States with not everybody having a basketball, not everybody having a court. Um, but all of that said, um, I told Laurel that um, I wanted to share with you guys a couple of really good resources uh, right now, some partners and friends of mine uh, just in this situation that are giving away their their platforms for free. Um, the Bology app, it's B-A-L-L-O-G-Y in English.com. You can go there, download the app for free right now. Coaches, you can uh, reach out through that platform and, and have access to uh, their coaches HQ. And it, it'll help uh, where Internet's available to help you pulse out information uh, some really cool drills, uh, different things that can kind of promote initiative with your kids. So I appreciate uh, our friends at Bology for doing that. And then another uh, partner of mine that um, these are super fortunate plugs that I'm being able to make today is trainthemind.com. If you go to train the mind and, and uh, Dr. Rizzo, you would love uh, these guys as well. <clears throat> They're giving away their platform for free right now, free subscriptions, but um, you get to interact with uh, sports professionals in mental skills training, which I think right now are, are absolutely uh, essential uh, to, to our young athletes all the way up to our professionals um, about the, the power of staying present and how we can keep things in perspective. Um, Graham Betchart's a good friend of mine in San Francisco, uh, and he's, he's one of the best in the world at training uh, professional athletes especially basketball players on how to, uh, you know, keep their wits about them right now in these times. So please take advantage of those resources. One other one really quickly, if you go to um, summit.coachesclinic.com and uh, Laurel's sharing this to everybody right now on cue. Um, it's a, it's an incredible uh, lineup of coaches from the NBA all the way down to nobody's like myself that have done clinics and sessions on different technical uh, elements. Most of it's basketball specific, but there are some that address sports mentalities in general. So I think um, in there in English, but I think they're very valuable and they're free again uh, and can come to you via the internet. So um, 
you know, we're, we're just trying to be adaptive. It's one of the most important, uh, you know, characteristics that an individual or an organization can have. We're here to help. I'm here to help. Please reach out. Um, and, uh, you know, again, I just want to thank our friends at, at World Learning and uh, the Sports Diplomacy Division of our, our State Department for continuing to work during these times to try to help use sport to connect, uh, dissolve barriers and sort of, uh, you know, fight some of these uh, circumstances that we're in. Uh, before continuing, um, it, and I, you know, we, we, I just looked at the, at the chat that is in the room and the last time I, I, I looked at it. There are like 76 people uh, watching this, which is which is a good number all over the world. So it's very exciting. Uh, I saw a few people that actually weren't part of our program. I mean, Araz, Araz actually is from Lebanon. He's a medical professional. And so we need to, to say here kind of collectively how grateful we are for all the medical professionals uh, actually active during this horrible crisis. Mm -hmm. I see Hicham from Morocco, Jennifer Hoffman, Lilith, uh, Matt Lyons from Atlanta, Tal Amar, so um, a bunch of people who are part of our program and others, uh, part of different networks. So uh, I want to thank them before the, you know, advancing to the next speaker for being with us. And, and, uh, and this is going to be a series of webinars because this one is uh, very successful and very important. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And uh, I want to introduce you to our next speaker. Uh, it's Manuk Sarkisyan from Armenia. He is a head coach of Armenia Numan's national team. Uh, created um, just um, a month ago. So I want him to tell a little bit how uh, he started this series of um, online exercises. Manuk. Hello, hello everyone. I'm Manuk, the professional team from Armenia. Uh, when this whole situation began, uh, we started online practice, uh, practicing the three times in the week. First, uh, we got the uh, opportunity to control their field. Uh, second, the players uh, feel that we're with them. Third, of course, their physical skill. Uh, online practicing help us overcome this situation. Uh, I'm an analysis coach. I have a lot of time uh, to work on my tasks. I explore tactical situation and uh, review what I have already done. Um, I want uh, to use this uh, all time uh, mindful and when the, will this situation stop because we continue our work. Uh, and I and if uh, any countries team need our help uh, during practicing. Uh, I'm always ready to help. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Manuk. And I think we will come back uh, on this because we'll need probably uh, to do more uh, fitness uh, practicing. And Manuk and some of the girls from national team will help us to uh, to host this uh, online practices. And um, for the good part, um, our last speaker here is Franak Viachorka from Belarus, the only, I think, one of the only football um, leagues that's still going on and uh, nobody's um, paying attention on virus and they are not afraid of virus. So, um, Franak, uh, let's see what you have and what's the situation there and how the league is continuing and how nothing is stopped so far. Hi everyone, uh, so hi from Minsk. So I think uh, Belarus these days is uh, the most uh, uh, sportive um, country in the world. So even coronavirus didn't manage to stop Belarus from playing football. And uh, this uh, Sunday, um, I tried to attend the football game. My father was super against and he said that he will kill me if I'll go. But my colleagues, journalists from German French channel Arte, they just like um, forced me to go to the match and to see how it's happening because that's the only active professional football in the world which is still playing. And uh, that's very funny to see how a professional uh, club, professional clubs fans, Premier League fans becoming fans of Belarus provincial uh, football teams. 
So I will show you some uh, some pictures and some um, videos if you don't mind. Um, I hope you see my screen, right? So this is yeah. our main uh, football player, and uh, <laughs> he's uh, he's the uh, best football player, ice hockey player, uh, everything player. And uh, but you know, in Belarus, um, sports it's a part of the ideology, in the bad sense. So it's not something you know like promotion of sports, it's a part like of being responsible, sure. active member of the society, but it's more about um, do sports, not politics, do sports, but don't touch, you know, social issues. And when coronavirus happened, everything was mixed because um, president, uh, he, uh, instead of fighting coronavirus, he began demonstrating how sportive he is. So he basically played every day ice hockey. He played every day like football. He organized the ice hockey tournament. And he said that uh, if we will be playing sports, coronavirus will not uh, kill us. So in th this interview. Lukashenko has consistently played down. I, I don't know if you hear, but basically he explained that um, uh, when you are playing ice hockey, uh, there is, like, the COVID can, cannot survive because it's too cold. And the same reason for football, uh, besides recommendations um, like opposite in, in, in protest of recommendations of World Health Organizations, which recommended to cancel all the sports events, including football, uh, games continued. And uh, this week, uh, this Sunday, two days ago, I went to the football game between two major football clubs. And uh, I saw hundreds of people waiting in line. So uh, the temperature was measured uh, at the entrance, of course. But uh, nobody kept distance, and majority of people really didn't wear uh, wear mask. And uh, I can't explain this phenomenon, you know, or people really don't afraid of virus, or they really love sports, so they uh, prefer, you know, to be uh, to be um, uh, to 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 be uh, vulnerable or um, um, or risk. To virus, but to to attend their favorite club game, I I, I cannot explain, but I think um, mm, it's it's like the situation how it shouldn't be. So sports is important. Um, getting people, especially young people, involved is critical. But it's always important to put uh, people's lives and health in the first place. So you can see that, of course, uh, tribunes are not full. Uh, stadiums are half full, I would say. Uh, but uh, everywhere on the TV, in the public transportation, I see the advertising of these games. And authorities, unfortunately, do not want to take any measures to, um, uh, to limit uh, the attendance. Do you see the video? Yeah. Yes. And uh, interesting also case, you know, that's, um, that's I would say, uh, COVID sports entrepreneurship. So uh, some, some businessmen, they began selling the virtual seats at the football games in Minsk. So you can pay uh, 25 euros and uh, the company in Minsk will put your printed uh, face on the seat and uh, you will be filmed like you're attending the game. So thousands of, of people from all, all, all over the world were able to put their mannequins on the, on the stadiums in, in the Belarus cities uh, these days. So th this actually case is interesting and it's funny. This is also creative. And I think that's actually the good solution. Yes, we keep the social distance, but we don't give up our favorite uh, sports. Um, I'll stop here. Perfect. Yeah, that's that's about Belarus. Thank you, thank you, Franak. And I forgot to tell you that Franak also is a vice president of Digital Communication Network, our co-organizers today. Thank you, Franak. Um, I think it's fascinating what's going on in Belarus, 
and hopefully no no more cases will be after this um, football matches. Um, okay, here I want to give um, a microphone or uh, to uh, Mr. Panayoto, uh, so he will uh, sum up what we talked uh, now, and uh, also let's see if we have some questions to our speakers. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, everyone, for sharing these valuable thoughts. We have one actually question uh, from uh, Anna that she asked. Uh, the question addressed to Franak, and the question is the following: How will the pandemic financial impact of the football industry? I mean, it, uh, will there, there be reductions to the, um, to the over the top football players' uh, salaries? What do you think? I think that's a question to everyone, you know, especially yes. here or involved in the industry itself. Uh, so I think, you know, all the industries, not only the, the football one will, will suffer and suffer a lot, but also it's, as, as I showed uh, in Belarus, also, it opens some opportunities, you know, for entrepreneurial and creative minds. So we will see. But perhaps other people here. Yeah, maybe maybe Ruben uh, could, you know, has more connection with the professional mm -hmm. football. Maybe he could answer uh, this question. <clears throat> if he's still with us. Ruben? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Now, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, here in Spain, uh, uh, some clubs uh, they they try to to get an, an agreement with the with the football players because now stadiums are closed, so it's very difficult to to the clubs to get money to pay for the salaries. But not all not all clubs try to try to do it because, of course, this is a little bit complicated because. We don't know how long we are going to be in this situation, and clubs uh, don't want to 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 change the contractual situation with the players because this can create problems for for the future. But all this 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 is only with big clubs, m m average clubs, medium clubs. All of them are trying to get uh, some kind of agreement with with players. Okay, uh, and, uh, would uh, anyone else that would like to correspond to the question? I mean, how this will actually impact uh, <coughs> the uh, and soccer all across the world? And I guess all other sports as well. Yes, exactly, actually, it's not only football. Um, I would actually like to ask everyone also, what do you think the, the impact will be also in the digital communication, let's say, industry? Especially what about the TV stations that they are, they have all these um, agreements in order to, to air these sports? What will be the impact regarding the Olympic Games that actually moved one year uh, later? What do you think regarding the, these events? Anybody could take this question? I think it's also mostly Ruben. It's connected to the professional sports. Mm -hmm. So the impact, the, impact, the impact on TV rights and, and revenues for media and the impact on the Olympics being postponed. Ruben, any thoughts? Well, uh, I, honestly, I, I, I'm, I'm not... Uh, uh, I, I'm not a specialist in this question, but this uh, here, La Liga and the government, they have been talking about this because uh, most of the revenues of the clubs, at least a half of the, reven of the revenues of football clubs come from, from television rights. So this is going to create a really big impact in, in football. So... Um, also, uh, you know, now uh, we will have to, to move all the dates regarding to the, to, the, to the leagues, regarding to the championship, and this will move all the championships further in, in the future. Every time we move a, champions, a, a championship further, we are, moving the, we are moving the revenues for the clubs further. So, uh, the impact, the economical impact is going to be 
it's going to be huge, but I think it's going to be huge in a short period of time. It's in, in a medium period of time, I think things are going to, to go back to the, to the normality uh, quite soon. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully, because, you know, the passion for sports is so intense that whenever the sports are going to start again, you know, all of us will be there, definitely. So I would like, you know, uh, because we are getting close to the closing time. So first of all, I want to tell you that, uh, you know, these webinars will continue. That means this is only the first series in a series. Um, it is a brainstorming session. Um, and we'll get to all of you and more people uh, in the future, um, as this period continues, hopefully not too long, uh, to actually organize, uh, even in different formats, uh, even more engaging, even trying some something a little bit more more experiential. But I would like to see if there is any way to at least hear, if not see, hopefully see also, uh, Ryan Murphy, who is from the um, Sports Diplomacy Division of the U.S. Department of State. Um, they are the ones, uh, you know, sponsoring and overseeing and coordinating uh, all these exchange programs. Uh, so this uh, webinar is part of uh, the exchange program that Ryan is in charge of. And, and I'd like to hear his thoughts, uh, you know, about, you know, how this period plays for them. Not talking about the, only about the fact that, that he's um, also, for lack of a better word, a sports fanatic. I know that when this whole thing started, Ryan was watching hockey games in, in, in Canada, in Los Angeles. So I, I assume that he's suffering tremendously for not being able to actually um, see sports. So Ryan, if you could, um, you know, maybe unmute your microphone or if you have camera, we would like to hear from you if it is possible. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Hopefully everyone can see and hear me. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. So first and foremost, I just want to thank World Learning for um, putting on the seminar. It's great when everything is shifted to virtual programming and having to do everything online. Uh, it was great that they were able to assemble such a great list of speakers. Um, and it's so nice to see so many familiar faces, uh, people that I've met before, people I haven't met yet. Um, so thank you all for, for participating in this. From the U.S. Department of State's standpoint, we obviously, what we do are people-to-people -people exchanges. Uh, the, those are the programs that we fund through our partnerships with World Learning and a number of great uh, U.S.-based nonprofit organizations uh, and through their partnerships with those amazing organizations around the world. When we obviously can't do people-to-people -people exchanges, uh, we can't bring communities together in this instance through sport. This is the next best way of, of keeping people connected. Uh, we certainly have been impacted by the, the global pandemic. We have been able to, or we've had to suspend a lot of our programming uh, both to the US and sending Americans overseas. Uh, we have a very robust Global Sports Mentorship Program that brings uh, adapted sports personnel to the U.S. for a month-long mentorship program that has been able to shift uh, to a virtual platform. So we're, we're trying to do this as much as we can uh, with a number of our programs. So it's great to see Vlad and Anna and, and others putting on this, this great seminar. Obviously, we want things to get back to normal uh, as soon as possible and at to keep everyone healthy. That's first and foremost, the most important thing on our standpoint or from our standpoint is to make sure everyone's healthy. We do know it's gonna take some time to get back to quote unquote normal. Uh, it's gonna take some time for the airlines to begin flying. It's gonna be take time for our colleagues at the US embassies and US consulates overseas to begin issuing visas. So that's all gonna play into to how soon we get back to doing programming. Um, but again, it's if we can keep doing these virtual programs that really helps kind of keep everyone engaged. It, there's been so many great um, examples of using sports as a way to engage communities, keep people active. Um, we as a division are doing a webin webinar series that we're gonna start next week. Um, 
at, called Get Fit. Uh, it's going to be a virtual program, uh, question and answer sessions, some uh, physical engagement. And we're starting out next week with a Paral U.S. Paralympic athlete, Deja Young, and she'll help us kind of kick off that session. So I will share that information with all of you once we have that uh, and the platform that we're using. But again, thank you all for for doing this. Again, it's great to, to reconnect with most of you or connect with you um, if I haven't met you yet. So thank you, Vlad, Nana, and, and Laurel, and everyone else from World Learning for putting this on, as well as the amazing speakers that you all have lined up. Thank you, Ryan. I'm still trying to figure out if Ryan is a Washington Capitals fan in hockey or any so, other team. So I grew up a, a New York Rangers fan. It's just where I grew up uh, going to those games. But I've been in, in the D.C. area for about 16 years, so they're my default team. Um, and as Vlad said, I was lucky slash unlucky. I was out in the L.A. area uh, when all of this was really coming, popping up in, in the U.S., and was able to see an Anaheim Ducks game on the Sunday. Uh, and then I was supposed to see a LA Kings game on the following Saturday. And unfortunately they had to cancel the season when I was out in, in LA and didn't get to see the game. So obviously disappointed about that. So really happy to see when, when the leagues will start back up and people will be able to, to watch sports live again. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. So thank you for everything that um, you, you do for your sports development worldwide and will continue this webinar series. So, Anna? Um, thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, everybody. I want to thank my colleagues, Laurel and Aaron, uh, Vlad. Uh, thank you for being here. And also, I want to thank my colleagues from Digital Communication Network, uh, Mr. Nikos Panayoto and Frana Kriachorka. Thank you very much. And thanks everybody for being a part of our first sports um, webinar and organized by World Learning and Digital Communication Network and uh, uh, supported by Sports Diplomacy, a division of State Department. Uh, we will uh, inform you about our next webinar soon. Uh, I want you everybody to be safe, uh, stay in touch. And um, again, thanks for being with us and hopefully we'll see you soon for on our next webinars. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.